right. I am happy to be joined with Joshua Otten. He is the CEO of Social Club TV. He joins us. Joshua, how are things? Things are great, man. Thank you for having me on. Love to have you on. You're uh, based out in LA. Um, obviously, a new company that, uh, well, I shouldn't say new. You've been in existence for how long? But before we get into this, obviously, my viewers are going to wonder who you are, what you do. So let's talk about Social Club TV and what you specialize in. Yeah, so we're the largest streaming and OTT platform in the world that's focused on cannabis, lifestyle, and psychedelic content. Yep. So uh, if I want to boil it really quickly down, we're MTV for cannabis and psychedelics. So we have uh, lifestyle content, we have uh, how-to content, we have educational, we have informative, uh, over 700 hours. And we're distributed in over and available in over 150 million homes. What's some of the content, I guess, that you're seeing that you've worked on that's garnered a lot of interest? Because now we face it in a day and age where... Let's face it, traditional media is shrinking rapidly. The 30 second commercial seems to be like a thing of the past when it comes to marketing and advertising and content marketing seems to be at the forefront what you're specialized in. So who are some of the people that you've worked in and what's been the response since its inception, knowing that, you know, these industries do face some challenges with marketing and advertising, but content marketing seems to be at the forefront. It's been great, right? So what we have right now is we're, we're really a television network. So number one, what that means is that we have eyeballs that are looking at our content for 25 to 26 minutes, where if you look at social media, it's under an average of 60 seconds. So number one is we're having a more engaged viewer. Yeah. And what that allows us to do is create more premium and long-form content. So we have shows like a show with DNA Genetics called Pit My Grow which, you know, you kind of get what that is just by hearing the name, right? So we wanted to reach the prosumer and the sort of smaller growers and, and DNA Genetics has this great rich history and uh, being able to do large scale grow. So they took their, their sort of operational techniques and went to six different sort of local uh, medically licensed growers in California and went in there and took these pretty shant you know, shanty ass, yeah. uh, you know, grows with bad lights and, and leaky air conditioners and overnight turned them into really cool things. And so we Very did that. Cool. We actually... Yeah, it was fun. We aired that and distributed that on Pluto TV, which is owned by Viacom first. We gave them exclusive and then it came to our platform. So that's been super popular. Um, and we're doing a lot of new content I'm really excited about. We're doing a show with Kyle Cushman uh, called Seed to Smoke, which is great. So the idea, again, is Kyle's this legendary grower who started out as a High Times writer and is just, you know, a, an author and everything else. And so we wanted to sort of show that whole process, you know, from Seed to Smoke. So we're trying to create um, story driven fun content that also allows brands to have really contextualized opportunities to integrate into yep. that shows audiences um, exactly what they're doing. So we, we have cooking shows, we have talk shows, uh, we work with everyone from Crazy Bone uh, to uh, this young, young upcomer, Jordan Conway on a show called Field Trip, which is fun. We had Kevin Smith on a series. So uh, we're doing a lot of stuff. And, and again, there's 700 hours of content. Uh, I think the thing that we're most recently really, really proud of is our partnership with the Emerald Cup Awards. So we produced over 30 hours of content for the Emerald Cup Awards, um, everything from um, talk, talks and panels and sessions about regenerative farming, uh, psychedelics, and, and had a lot of great leaders in, as part of that. It's very, very cool. And let's face it, we live in a day and age where it's all about streaming services right now. Your platform is available on streaming services that include Roku, Hulu, Apple TV. You bring this all together and people are going to say, okay, what do these guys want to talk about? And that's the reason why I wanted to have you on today. So as much as like you've produced a ton of content with cannabis, you're pivoting now in the ever emerging psychedelic industry. And I found this fascinating in a recent post that you made on LinkedIn, you brought up the question, what can the emerging psychedelic industry learn from the existing pharmaceutical industry when it comes to marketing and advertising, which really paints the picture as to how much the marketing landscape has shifted, as I said before, to content marketing in 2021. So I begin with, and these are staggering stats, the pharmaceutical industry spends over $4.6 billion on their total media budget every year, 4.6 billion. So to put that into context, the uh, market capitalization of the two biggest psychedelic companies by far is only around 2.7 billion on an undiluted basis. So saying this, what can psychedelic companies learn from from big pharma in terms of advertising presence even before the medicine is available to uh, to the public yeah and that's a great stat right so and, and to make it even more compelling that actually that 4.6 billion number is actually just tv and streaming advertising it's actually six eight when you look at the totality of it so just tv and streaming and why is that important it's because pharmaceutical industries learned early on that they're creating products that have outcomes for patients yeah and and the best way to do that is you have to educate their patients or the prospective patients on what these products are before they go to the doctor. If you're expecting someone to go to the doctor 
tell them they have all these problems. And the doctor to say, well, then you need to get this product, regardless of whatever your relationship is with that medical facility or the doctor, it's, you're going to not grow very quickly. So the first lesson for the pharmaceutical industry was if we're going to create outcome-based products and we're going to create uh, pharmaceutical products that are going to help alleviate uh, chronic conditions or mental illnesses or whatever it is that they're going to address, we need to directly communicate to the consumers and the patients, and let them know this is what it does and, and this is how it works. And so TV is still by far up to 75% the most effective way because yeah. you're telling stories. Yeah. And even if it's a commercial, it's still a short 30 second story. Oh, you have you know, an older woman who's a grandmother and she, she's rubbing her hands and she tries to bake the cake and it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden, you know, magically their hands are working again and she's smiling with, yeah. her, with her, their, their granddaughter and they're baking a the cake. And we kind of, you know, they're almost like ripe for- People SML can relate skits. to that, right? But it works. It works because you're essentially saying, this is you and this is you before, and this is you after. The hurdle for the psych psychedelic industry is beyond just sort of having access to that medium to drive their awareness is that it's actually, they're not looking for new patients. They're looking to convert patients who are already using existing treatments. Bingo. So if I, have a, if I have mental illness or I have some sort of problem that I, I that we, even if it's undiagnosed, I'm either using something whether it's over the counter, it's prescription, or unfortunately, a lot of people are self-medicating because they don't have something that's helping them. And so everyone is in some way or another addressing these chronic issues, especially in the mental illness range. So uh, mental health, excuse me. So they are going to have to convert these, these, these patients into trying and trusting their product. And the thing is, it, it, it's a lot of, it needs content and it needs context. You need to be able to communicate what it is and what you're doing. So our, our, our overall pivot in the sense of we want to be a source for this information. We're, we're gearing up to essentially by Q3 be the largest OTT streaming platform, or excuse me, have the largest library of content in psychedelics on, the, on any streaming platform in the world. It's, and the way that we're doing that is we're, we're partnering with Psyched21 and we're producing over uh, 80 different panels and sessions over the next three months. Um, that's going to do everything from workshops to fireside chats, to panels and sessions covering, you know, indigenous wisdom and plant yeah. culture and medicine to entrepreneurial <clears throat> things. So what is some of the stuff that you're seeing and hearing? You're probably speaking to a number of psychedelic companies. Let's say you're sitting down meeting with the CEO. There's a lot of parameters that you have to get around, obviously, and compared to Bob, big pharma versus psychedelics, knowing that, you know, there's a lot of restrictions as to what you can and can't do when it comes to marketing and advertising, hence the whole reason for content marketing. But what I'm starting to see more and more is a lot of big name social influencers, celebrities, uh, whether uh, it's somebody like a, a Chelsea Handler or um, Rashad Evans, you know, a big UFC fighter at one time, uh, just announced that he's big into the whole psychedelic space. Um, when you look at some of these people, what, what are the routes and how do you get your message across knowing there's a lot of restrictions as to what you can and can't do? So you, you really nailed it into to three sort of categories that I think any psychedelic uh, company needs to start exploring in order to get uh, traction. Number one is third-party validation. You saying your stuff is great and works doesn't matter, right? We need to have other people validate your product or your service or your medicine. And by, by doing that, you need to have other people sort of communicating your behalf. These are people who are offering discovery of what you're offering to their existing audience, right? The second thing is you need to create content around that. And that content needs to be premium. It needs to be trustworthy. Um, social media is fine. Social content's great. Um, I always advocate an omni-channel approach. You got, you know, any brand, whether it's in the psychedelic space or the cannabis space needs to, you know, just really have an omni-channel approach to, to, to sort of cover all these areas. But, um, and that comes to reach. So how are you reaching those consumers? Right. Social media is great, you know, but that, that content's disposable. It goes up once, they look at it once, it's on to the next. All of the algorithms, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, or, or Instagram, or even Twitter, it's based on what's the newest topical thing. You have to constantly be creating new content. So by the nature of the beast, by the actual medium of and the format within you're creating that content, right? It's, it's almost backwards thinking to create evergreen content in that format because it's not gonna be continuously discovered, unfortunately. That's where we come in. We want to be that platform where people are continuously discovering or rediscovering and rewatching content. Why is Friends being seen over and over again right. 20 years later or Seinfeld or any of these shows? Because they're evergreen, 
and you're going to have existing audiences that are going to rediscover them and share with them. So we're a different platform than social media. We want to make that very clear. But again, we're a great platform that focuses on content and storytelling. Well, and, and that's great. What I see, um, people need to understand, obviously, right. what this whole industry is about. And whether you agree or disagree with Big Pharma, they have basically been marketing and advertising for the better portion of 25, 30 years. People are used to that. And that's what seems normal to them. I see a lot of these clinics coming up. They seem very, very interesting, very, very promising, but there's still a lot of unknown. And I'm sure there's a lot of people, if they were to choose this route of medication, there's still a lot of great unknowns. And I think with that, if people don't really understand something, there's probably some fear at first. So I I'm curious to know, like, um, some of the projects that you're working on, what's the feedback that you get from some of these CEOs and how do you accomplish that? Yeah, so you brought up a really good point. So um, the psychedelic industry and, and the medications and the services that they're, that they're developing and providing and rolling out, um, they, have, they, they actually have a, a, a bit of a disadvantage because they have to get over decades of stigma, right? right? That, was, that was false stigma that was exactly. per perpetrated by big pharma and perpetrated by the government and all these different things. So they have to not only be beyond the legality, let's just say blue sky, it was turned on tomorrow and federal legalizations were opened up and it happened quicker than cannabis, et cetera, et cetera. And you could start essentially scaling this thing on an, on a multi-state operational level. You're still going to have to, you know, convert and convince people who've been told that these, these things were bad for a long time. On top of that, you're having to fight a war chest that, as you point out, is bigger than the entire industry is right now in the, in the $6.8 billion range that's being spent annually. So uh, how are we, you know, again, how are we doing that and how can they address that? I think it always goes back to, you know, creating brand trust through long form content to explain to consumers, this is what this experience is like, right? right? This is what you're getting out of this. This is how it works. This is where it comes from. This is what the research is, but doing it in a way that um, it can't be bite-sized. It can't be 15 seconds. You're not going to be able to get that communication across that quickly. So until there's ubiquity, until you know there's ketamine clinics everywhere and there's a bigger knowledge about it it's up to the industry to educate people patients and consumers on what these you know what these treatments are what the research is uh where the background is i mean plant medicine is being used for for millennia so right. um how, how can we tie that and i think again that's what i'm excited about what we're doing right now is we're trying to create that connection between indigenous wisdom plant medicine healing and modern techniques and science that's really you know through you know, all of the amazing things these companies are doing are finding, you know, true efficacy with very low side effects. And in some cases is permanently rewiring the brain, right? Yeah. To literally, it's not about like, they always joke, pharma jokes, the, the money isn't in the cure, it's in the treatment. But right. we're seeing, we're seeing people being to, you know, I, I don't want to say cured, but we're certainly seeing people who have chronic uh, mental health issues who are almost being basically cured from a couple of treatments where, you know, it, it's rewiring the brain in an amazing way. So how do we tell that story? And then the last thing is, how do you do it in a way that differentiates what you're doing from everyone else is doing? Because right. that's the other thing. The commoditization of this industry happens quickly. And it yeah. happens because uh, everyone's saying the same thing. Everyone's, you know, maybe differentiating slightly, but no one knows. We just, we, no one really knows outside of people like yourself who are the inside, right? You're on the inside track. So you yeah. kind of understand the difference between this company and that company. And you understand the difference in products and research and application. But ultimately the first, first movers who are really understanding that they can own the mind share on a broad scale of what they're doing and how to differentiate and then own that trust and use it through content marketing, they're going to have that for a while. And uh, we do see some ex excitement and interest in that. And I think that's what we're looking forward to, to helping uh, build in the next quarter. The average consumer right now is spending between eight and nine hours of reading content on their phone every day. Think about that. And that's probably even, I bet you it's probably even more than that. But saying that, um, would you say, like, as you said, you have to really emphasize on long format content. Do you think this will be the number one source of marketing dollars that are spent within this industry, both short term and long term? And that is content marketing. I, I, absolutely. So I, if you want to look at a content marketing and you want to scale that up to even include 30 second commercials, right? Because that is what a commercial is. It's a small story that you're telling through video in 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, the reality is that's where 
uh, again, specifically psychedelics, that's where pharma is spending 75% of their budgets because it's effective. It's, it's storytelling. Wow. Yeah, it's 75% of their budget. Um, and, and, you know, again, even on the cannabis space, um, look at, you know, if you want to look at uh, Constellation Brands, Constellation Brands invested $4 billion into the, into the cannabis space, right? Yeah. They're the second largest spender on advertising in the beer, wine, and alcohol space in the world. They spend $365 million a year on just advertising Corona and their other uh, wine and spirits. 80% of that's on television. Right. So- if you want the playbook, if you want to know, if, you, if you're aspirationally looking ahead, whether it's two years or 10 years down the road, where you're going to be and you think you're going to be a market leader and you're going to have tens of millions to hundred millions of dollars, you, you know, that's going to be in these long form formats. I'll give you one quick more story. So, you know, uh, I've been in the media space for a long time. I've been in content premium and branding and advertising for a long time. I've been in cannabis uh, media since 2014. Um, you know, we, <clears throat> when they came out with Quibi, Quibi made a, a brief assumption. They said, hey, the younger audience has short attention spans. As you point out, they're on their phone all the time, but they like premium content. Right. So it's like one plus one plus one equals 10. And I looked at it, I said, that is the worst, that is yeah. the worst business model I ever heard. And I'll tell you why. Because those same young kids who supposedly, you know, have short attention spans who like premium content, they're going home and watching Stranger Things for 13 hours. Yeah. They're watching so much Netflix that Netflix is saying, are you still watching? There's actually a subset of people who are watching so much Netflix right now, even pre-pandemic and obviously during the pandemic and increased that Netflix is losing money on them, even though they're paying subscribers because their CDN cost of streaming is going through the roof. I mean, it, so, so that's obviously a very small number of people, but my point is um, consumers and audiences are still watching TV and more and more TV. Why did Amazon buy MGM brand right. or MGM, excuse me. They bought it for two reasons. One, because they they're owning franchises. Yeah. So they, they believe in the franchise model. Yeah. So they, they bought it not they bought it for James Bond, the IP, not James Bond, the old movies, right? right. Yeah. And they bought it because long tail, they understand that media and content drives purchase intent, period. It is yeah. the best way to drive consistent purchase intent because you have reach, frequency. You have all the things that we talk about. Third-party validation. James Bond's wearing this watch. That's a cool watch. You have reach. Hundreds of millions of people are watching James Bonds. You have frequency. They're watching it over and over again. So you have this in a premium content format. Um, so Amazon learned this early on. And you know their, their ad business is going through the roof. I mean, Amazon yeah. now has an ad business on IMDb Pro and everything else. That's killing it. So again, uh, streaming, television, ad-supported television, it's actually not going away. It's growing. Ad-supported uh, consumption has gone up 16% month over yeah. month. Yeah, people are getting subscription fatigue, but they're not getting content fatigue. Right. They're they're getting fatigue finding the content they want, and that's the other sort of key. Meaning. So how do you answer that? that? I answer that because we are delivering very specific content to a very specific person. Stay who in wants your lane, content. right? Do one thing. Stay in my really lane. Well. So so I don't need ten million people. You know, we talked about this the other day, Shad. CNBC is getting one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand eyeballs per show, right? Shark Tank, the most popular episode, it wasn't a million views. It was 250,000 views. Right. So the point is- Fox um, Business but that, News at night during the Trump uh, administration, number one show across the country, 400, 450,000 viewers across the country. I used crazy. to work so, in radio. Some of our morning yeah. shows got a million like listeners yeah, in a day, 100%, right? Yeah, I was, I was living in LA. I drove to school in like the 90s and it's like KTO, you know, whatever, the KCRW or whatever those, any of those places would get millions, right? And obviously the media landscape has shifted, but the point is, again, you have to understand, like if I was a YouTube star and I yeah. was like, hey, I, get, I got 200,000 views per episode, it would be like, you know, I guess who cares? Or if I was a Twitch streamer, you know, two or 300,000 views per stream, it wouldn't make me a millionaire. If you got 200, 300,000 people per episode of your content on mainstream television, you'd be on, you'd be on network. I know. Okay. So, so my point is, um, again, the numbers are important, but you're reaching a consumer that is watching for a long period of time. They're watching for 25 minutes, not 30 seconds yeah. or 60 seconds. Right. You're, they're, they're targeted. They, they are here for that information. If you look at our advertisers, on Social Club TV for the last 18 months. Well, we launched in May, but we had a, a smaller version of it up before that. But really, let's just look at the last year. Some of the biggest advertisers, 99% of them are not in cannabis or psychedelic. Del Taco, Postmates, Advil. Yeah. 
so if you start to look at these categories, actually Toyota, car, auto. So these That's are marketing 101. Who, they want the audience, right? They want the audience. They want to know where they live. They want to know their zip codes or DMAs. Those are first born. But now they're starting to actually pay more attention to who those consumers are. They want to know the psychographic information, demographic information. They want to know qualitative and quantitative data. So what we're able to give them is saying, hey, the, the, for instance, the cannabis consumer is more likely to buy your product, shop at home, go for delivery, blah, blah, blah. We have all that data ready to go. And so they're coming in and they're paying more of a premium to reach these consumers. What I'm getting at, what I'm getting at is, this is the opportunity for the psychedelic industry to own this audience because if they don't, pharma is going to buy against it. And they yeah. will anyways. Yeah. I had a great conversation with Chris Killam, the medicine hunter. He's had shows on Fox for years. And he looked back and he said, you know, it was so surprising even years ago. I mean, Chris, Chris was talking about this way before anything was legal. Yeah. And he was saying the biggest advertisers were always pharmaceutical because they knew. Yeah. They knew yeah. that people were tuning in being like, wait a second, this is medicine and it's doing something I need to explore. So- yeah. Well, to put things into perspective, when I say traditional media is shrinking, ABC's 2020 show back in the 90s would average between 30 and 40 million an audience on Friday nights. And when you go back and look at Fox News, you're getting 400,000 and that's deemed successful now. But that's just yeah. a huge shift in the whole media landscape. But one thing's for sure, with the data that we collect, you can pretty much weed out the people that aren't relevant to you and go after your 100% precise audience. How do you do that? To your point is that people want more and more content based on the amount of time that they're spending each and every day on their tablets and phones. Last question I wanted to ask you was recently announced, wasn't sure if you're aware of this, but uh, the California Senate will floor a, a bill legalizing the possession of psilocybin and various other psychedelic compounds. So I wanted to ask in your view, do you think this opens up creative advertising opportunities for companies, even though their federal schedule one status hasn't changed? A hundred percent. If again, who's going to own that story? Who's going to, who's going to tell that narrative? You know, there's opportunities for uh, companies who are even in the research and R and D phase. We you know we just actually, I think we just read, uh, you'll probably know the brand, but a company just imported the first legal uh, uh, psilocybin uh, ever. Right. I think that yeah, happened Wake a couple Network days ago. Came in from Jamaica. Yep. Right. So, so the idea there is how did someone not film that entire path? How is that on a show right now? Are you kidding me? Like what a wasted opportunity. Like how did we not go down there, see it being cultivated, see it being packaged up, see, hear the story. Hear I the smell like, an idea up. for you and I, after we get off this but, interview, huh? But, but I mean, it's, it's I, I'm listening right. to this and I'm like, it's a news bite that sounded interesting. And guess what? I don't even remember, no disrespect. I don't remember who it was. And by two weeks from now it's gone. And the next news cycles there. And the next new hot thing, if this was a piece of content that was a story and a narrative and a multi-part, and, and we literally had a camera as it was being transported and all these really cool things, this becomes something that's shared. People and visualize it, understand it, right? Well, and then not only that, this becomes the birthplace of the movement. This piece of content is 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 shared over decades and, and has relevance because this is the first time it happened. So my point is, this is the time to tell these stories. This is the time to capture that content. It's not later when you know, you're know you doing it because your CMO, who you stole from Moderna, is, is coming up with a strategy and you're now competing for Mindshare with 20, yeah. 30, 40 other companies. I mean, you'll do that then anyways. But yeah, anyway, that, that, that's where I'm coming at is that there's amazing stories happening every day and it's exciting. And instead of just having a simple news bite where it flashes up, it's cool. Maybe the stock price goes up and maybe, you know, which is fine. I get that opportunity, but it's like, you know, let's, let's have this live on forever in evergreen content and continue, you know, people are going to share, Oh, what did you watch this? You got to see this. This is really cool. Well, in some respects, some of the companies that have done well, they've already strategically come up with some great branding opportunities. Like, Mind Med going after a Kevin O'Leary, and there are companies on par with their research. However, people are just more familiar with the Mind Med brand. Now we get, you know, what's the next stage? What's the next step? What happens to the actual research that's involved? And most importantly, the brands that eventually, in due time, if uh, eventually, uh, you know, federally legalized, uh, what do they become? But uh, needless to say, it's obviously a promising time to be in your field. And this whole industry, obviously, the media landscape continues to change, but this is the way of the future, is it not? Yeah, I, I think it is. And, and we're in a really good space. Like I said, we're, we're launching the Psyched uh, 2020, uh, 2021 conference here. Uh, can I talk about what we're doing together with the yeah, Dales of Report? Course. We're, we're, yeah, please. So we're, we're really excited to actually, we'll announce it officially, but we're going to be partnering with the Dales Report and getting all your content on our platform. We believe that it's a, it's a strong, you're a great, strong partner. I'm really excited about that. And uh, we're going to be a good nexus. What happens early in industries, it happened in cannabis, 
obviously in CBD and then in psychedelics is the, the sort of first movers are actually inner, you know, they work within the space, right? Because you're, you're consuming content about your own industry, but it's tough to then break out and sort of present that to the mainstream audience. And we're going to be that bridge. We're going to have the industry elites, the CEOs, the investors, those people are going to be following uh, our stuff. But at the, at the same time, we're going to be able to, um, you know, get mainstream consumers, mainstream audiences and sort of scale this because as you point out, we're on, we're going to be on Apple TV, we're on Roku, we're on Plex, we're on Strum. Uh, we have a partnership with Viacom. So we're on 17 different networks and available over 150 million homes and we're going global. Uh, Brazil, Mexico, South South Africa, uh, New Zealand. So it's pretty exciting time for us and, and we, ha we have a really wide audience. Keep up the great work, but it's uh, obviously uh, great working with you. And at the same time, too, happy to have you on here today. But uh, let's keep this conversation going. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. Right. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Josh. Bye -bye.